Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Haslam. Welcome to uh, Granada Studios. Uh, yeah, we've got an amazing event happening. In about four minutes' time, we're going to see New Order live from Granada Studios, part of Manchester International Festival, as you probably know because you're on the website. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the show, and also with me is Liam Gillick, the internationally renowned artist. Um, so, yeah, so uh, my involvement as curator of this event goes back... Uh, 24 months, maybe a little bit more, when I sent an email to Manchester International Festival, who I've worked with before, and New Order, who I know and love, saying, you people should get together and do something special for Manchester International Festival. Um, and they met. And the point of the festival is to do something special. Manchester's full of great activity, 52 weeks a year, every year. But during the festival, there's 18 extraordinary days when we all kind of go up, move up a level. And so the first thing that we decided when we all got around the table was that we'd do something different at this festival. And New Order, of course, are the perfect band to do that. It's not about nostalgia. New Order always evolving. They're always pioneering. I mean, just look at how out of the ashes of Joy Division, they kind of recreated themselves and they still recreate and reimagine themselves. So I was really thrilled to be part of the project. And also, of course, the other thing I love about New Order and Joy Division is the visual aspect. Peter Saville was amazing. The photographs of Kevin Cummins, we kind of think of New Order and Joy Division visually as well as musically. And that's why it was brilliant that Liam came on board. Now, Liam, you better explain to everybody what, <laughs> what role you've had. Well, at the beginning, my role was to be, to try and get into this, right, as a piece of work, to treat it like an artwork, to treat it like a collaborative project. And the great thing due to the people around it, like you, and also Peter, to a certain extent, and some of the others, it was treated right from the beginning as, uh, as work. Do you see what I mean? Like really putting together something new rather than trying to be cynical or trying just to go back over things somehow. Yeah. I mean, the thing was that the band were very keen that it shouldn't be a gig, but then we didn't know what it was going to be. <laughs> so we called it like a happening and we called it various things. But the important thing was that it was, it was different. And um, I mean, if you could tell maybe tell me also why you were kind of passionate about working with New Order particularly. I think a lot of people talk about the visual aspect of factory records and all the graphics and whatnot. And I think that's really, really important. But the other side of it as a visual artist that was really key for me is a way of working, like a uh, kind of how the band actually operates and how they've worked over time and how they've played with codes, right? Like how they played with systems within music, but at the same time remained um, emotive and creating a feeling of like great strength through quite structural, complicated um, invention. And that to me is really interesting. So it's funny what you were saying about not knowing what to call it. Right from the beginning on The Quiet, I wanted it also to be a gig. I want my involvement as an artist was to try and model a kind of a concert experience that is from a sort of parallel universe, if you like. <laughs> well, we're going to enter that parallel universe in just a moment. I mean, the other thing I think about the band, which uh, is important to me, was that you know, although uh, they're very visceral, I mean, as Joy Division, I mean, I was lucky enough to see Joy Division, who were ultimate vi visceral band, but also kind of artistic and musical and a new order, artistic, musical, danceable. Um, all those elements come together. And that, that really is one way reason why I think they've soundtracked my life in a way, because they cover all those phases of how you might feel from one day to the next. Yeah, I completely agree. And the thing is, I don't think there's a single exhibition I worked on in the last nearly 30 years where I, there wasn't a moment when I listened to New Order and sometimes it's because I was stuck sometimes it's because I was happy sometimes it was just New Order yeah I mean for, for me the other thing about New Order is that as I said about the evolution of them they've got one more um, show during Manchester International Festival which is on Saturday but the opportunity to see them play has been brilliant for me anyway Liam we'd, we're gonna have to uh, go and see the show in a minute. So thank you. Anyway, I've not had a chance to thank you for the for the visual element. As the viewers will see, the visual element is really strong. Uh, the band, uh, I think, they seem very relaxed to me. Uh, this is the fourth one. Okay, it's new order time, everybody. Thank you. Okay, we're going to pick things up a little now.
Yes, thank you. Thank you.
Fantastic audience, you've been great. I hope we've lived up to your expectations. Good night. Welcome everybody. They definitely lived up to expectations that night and uh, throughout the run. Uh, that was New Order live from 2017 Granada Studios. Uh, and welcome to this Manchester International Festival special event. Um, I'm Dave Haslam. Uh, I DJed at the Hacienda, uh, the club co-owned by Factor Records and New Order back in um, the 1980s. Um, and I write about music, not just Manchester, but uh, my most recent book is about Courtney Love. And we're going to be talking about um, New Order, Factory, and that amazing live show uh, for the next 40 minutes. Uh, and I have with me a uh, special guest, uh, Peter Saville. Uh, Peter Saville, uh, one of the um, co-founding directors of Factory Records uh, and a consultant at Manchester International Festival and designer of some of the greatest record sleeves ever produced, notably those by Joy Division and New Order. And my other guest is Liam Gillick, whose art and his concept was integral to what we've just seen. Um, and also there are one or two questions that have come through various social media uh, from the audience tonight. Um, many, many thousands of people watched that stream. I want to quickly say a hello from Manchester to everybody uh, around the world who's been watching that show uh, in these pretty crazy bad times that we're having at the pandemic. Um, so a special hello and love and solidarity to you all from Manchester. Uh, my personal highlight of that show is uh, when Bizarre Love Triangle goes into Vanishing Point. Oh my God, it was like my life was complete. <laughs> I'm going to start by um, asking Peter and Liam um, what their highlight was. Liam, obviously you went to the five shows at Granada. You went to uh, OGR in Torino and to Vienna. Seeing that footage again, what do you think is the most significant thing? What really sticks in your mind? What's hard to understand from watching it and listening to it is that everyone's playing live. It's There's no sequencing going on. People are actually playing those transitions and those rhythms underneath that, that form the kind of basis of the tracks. They're playing them live during the concert. And in a way from this footage, it's slightly deceptive. You're not really aware of the input of the young musicians in the, the who are sitting in the set who are actually playing. So it's... I kind of agree with you on this vanishing point moment. That 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 transition into vanishing point for me, I don't know what it does. There's some kind of, I'm not a musician, so I don't know what's going on musically, but there's something that happens that kind of turns the turns the screw, as it were, and emotionally speaking. And yeah, uh, yeah that's a big, big highlight for me. Uh, Peter, I think you saw the show at least one of, one of those nights, and obviously you've watched that again. Yeah, I, what I'm, big I think I might have seen the first night. Um, watching the footage just then, uh, my highlight was Bernard's T-shirt. And um, <laughs> I, I have to find out where he got it. It was obviously it was obviously kind of riffing off, um, off the old Granada logo, which, of course, linked to the So It Goes title for this, the name yeah. of, of Tony's show back in the late 70s. Um, the, I mean, just watching it, though, that, that whole kind of balance between a sort of uh, systems and chaos, which is sort of, which is always kind of evident in a New Order gig um, because of this kind of conflict between the programmed and, 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 and live. And um, there was this general kind of feeling of something just sort of teetering on the edge of control or actually almost atomizing out of control. 
and, and I, I think that was uh, that that bit of footage really captured that. And and, and it's just yeah, as Liam was, it is worth mentioning that 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 whole project was about the kind of polyphonic sound in which the the, the way the group normally work with with uh, um, um, uh, synthesizers and and program music that was all deconstructed into into monophonic and and the 12 musicians in the in the the grid behind the band were all fulfilling the 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 individual parts of what is normally a polyphonic sound and and of course that was the the incredibly interesting thing musically about about the whole project yeah so a special thank you to joe dudell who did the arrangement and the synthesizer orchestra, the, the 12 young students from Royal Northern College of Music who are having a Zoom party this evening and they're replicating the grid from Granada Studios onto their Zoom screen as we speak. So hello to them. Um, How many people can you get at a Zoom party? Somebody invited <laughs> me to one the other day and I'm just wondering just how many people can be on a Zoom party? <laughs> um, viewers may not know that um, Peter Saville, famous designer, uh, or, or is almost or equally famous for not being particularly technically savvy in, in the modern world. Do you have a smartphone yet, Peter? I do, but I don't use it for phone calls. <laughs> OK. Uh, can I ask you to about um, what we're going through at the moment, this isolation? We are going to talk about New Order, and I am going to ask Peter about, about design, but... Given where we are, I, I would like to know just how, uh, Liam, you're speaking from New York and obviously things are very tough there. Can you just give us a little flavor of what, it, what it's like for you? Yeah, it's um, a very, very difficult situation and you can see that the class issues in this city are really revealed in a really brutal way. If you are um, a working class person in New York right now, you're at incredible risk and you have real difficulty, there's real problems structurally with the health system here about private health that put people in incredible danger. So it's it's a divided city like never before. Um, having said that, it's also very peaceful and quiet, of course, and you can hear the birds singing in the morning when you wake up, which is a very, very weird thing. I didn't move to New York so I could hear the birds singing in the morning. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tough tough time. Very very difficult. Uh, I'd like to a uh, special shout out to my friends in in Italy, in uh, Vicenza and Torino and Milano. They're having uh, such a dreadful time in north, northern Italy. I wonder, Peter, what do you think? I mean, obviously, the people in the arts and culture world, many of them self-employed, many of them freelancers, many of them musicians. The events have all been cancelled. Uh, clubs yeah. and venues are on a knife edge. I mean, do you, uh, obviously things are pretty grim, but in, in your experience, do you think the resourcefulness will eventually play itself out and, and we will we will get some kind of a new world? Uh, uh, if only. Um, I mean, resourcefulness does not pay the rent. And, and we are talking about people... Um, who are a little bit on the edge anyway, you know, I mean, even I have been, you know, most of my working life, just sort of, just fortunately the last few years on the right side of Solvent, but for 20 years or so, I, I absolutely wasn't. Um, and, and basically everything kept going, generally like our social economy itself, everything kept going as long as nothing terrible happened. Well, something terrible has happened, and, and uh, which basically makes it, um, really quite impossible for many, many people. And, and I mean, I'm, I feel very fortunate. My landlord has given me a, you know, a, a rent holiday for a month in the studio. And, and, um, and that's a relief. But if, um, if one doesn't get some support, um, most of the creative community do, do not have the assets or the capital to fall back on. And it will be, um, uh, you know, interesting, but that's a, a, a rather benign way of putting it. It's a concern as to exactly um, how many people will, will will be getting by at the moment. Yeah. And, um, okay. and, yeah. Out on the street. I mean, I'm quite happy in the studio. I'm, these days, I am quite happy to stay in. So 
I'm basically, you know, kind of, uh, it's relatively normal for me. But but when I do go out and walk around, you know, Clerkenwell, where I live, it's like an episode of The Twilight Zone. Mm. Um, I just, uh, I'm, look, not, I'm looking at my mobile phone, not to be rude to everybody, but just because I'm getting uh, messages from um, Manchester Festival HQ about questions that have been posed during uh, the streaming. And there is a question for Liam from uh, Aaron Avia. Um, how did you take into account the previous visual language of New Order established by Peter Savile and Factory? And how did you instill your own unique vision in the show we've just seen? Well, Peter's very influential on me as an artist. One of the reasons I became an artist was not necessarily because I looked at other art, but because I looked at the cultural and social context around me. And that's where I found inspiration, not just in Peter's graphic design in itself, but also the organizational aspect to Factory Records and how it functioned as a kind of, uh, uh, not exactly a collective, but a strangely, uh, a strange setup that had odd hierarchies, if you like. So. I think about it as a political thing as much as anything else as well. The idea that somehow art and aesthetics is always intimately linked to history. And I think Peter's talked about this before, that in a way, his journey with, with the work he did, certainly for New Order, did take you through a kind of century of, of design from various different avant-gardes and various different moments of understanding through to postmodernism. So it's kind of in me anyway, right? On the yeah. other hand, what I'm trying to do here is is we were really working together. You know, I was working with the band, meaning that uh, for nine months there was this process while they broke down the songs and, to, and had them scored by Joe and, and rehearsed with the musicians. And Stephen, who needs to be acknowledged not only as the greatest drummer that has ever lived, but also in these concerts, you don't even think about the fact that he's playing live throughout what we just heard. It's extraordinary, extraordinary discipline, extraordinary uh, power, but very controlled. Stephen had spent all that time breaking down the track so I could see them digitally and visually. So I'm working with the music as a visual language, right? That's basically an answer. So I'm trying to not add a story on top of the music, but I'm trying to take the structure of the music, break it down and reinsert it um, onto the set and as part of the physical moving set as a way of kind of um, underscoring the music. Do you see what I mean? Creating a kind of substructure to the music. Um, That's and because <clears throat> Dave, Dave, it was also very evident to me just sort of um, catching up with the process every so often and particularly the the week that the events were on it it was it was very evident to me how much more closely with new order uh, liam has worked than 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 i actually ever did you know my, my relationship with them with them was all, always actually kind of quite remote but because but because this was performative and because they were in, in the very midst of what liam was doing um they obviously work, worked much more closely together, and, and Bernard and Liam get get on really well. Actually, and Bernard and I usually just, in a way, kind of um, we sort of spar with one another. And uh, I think Liam, Liam's got a Liam's got a more comfortable relationship, um, certainly with Bernard than I do. Yeah, but um, we just what the first meeting. I went there. Bernard was there. Stephen was there, and they wanted to start working. And that's a credit to Dave, who actually has a curator role in this in this whole project yeah, he's yeah. The, the person who yeah, brought people together in the, uh, in the intro back in 2017 i mean uh, in, in terms of being a curator i kind of just thought that new order and mif should talk uh, and then we had a few meetings and you know the band were very keen on doing something different you know they they were that you know they could uh, whatever fill the men arena anytime playing you know all their amazing tunes but they did understand that the international festival was about pioneering new work and um so we had various ideas and actually it was bernard um who uh came up up with a what is more or less a doodle of the a grid um and 
And so, yeah, uh, uh, Bernard, Bernard's idea of the grid kind of began the whole process. Um, and at, at that point, um, having made a couple of phone calls and attended some meetings and had a few biscuits, I then um, left the um, real artist to get on with it. Um, and we, I have actually had a question from uh, Milena from Buenos Aires, and who wants to know, Liam, a little bit more about the uh, the grid and, and the 12 musicians. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I was thinking a lot about Alain Robbe-Grier and the, the book Jealousy, which is jalousy in French, or the same word for Venetian blind. So I wanted to have this sense of <clears throat> how you could take this initial idea and turn it into something. And the, the idea was then to um, uh, basically to make a, a, a layering, right? An analog layer, which is the physical movement of the shutters, where the right. young musicians can always see. They can see through the little slits, even when it looks shut. So it creates this voyeuristic relationship between these young musicians and these more experienced musicians, right? And then layered on top of that, um, the the white light and the pattern that you see moving, which some of it's taken from early, um, in a way, early computing, early uh, systems for operating looms in mills. Basically, they were kind of card systems that would run the the, the mill machines. And some of it is purely based on the musical structure. That's actually a series of quick time movies that are projected on top of these moving system. On top of that further is, and I got to give a shout to Andy Little, who did the lighting mainly live and he feels it, right? He feels the concert, he's worked with Joy Division, New Order forever. And Andy and I probably spoke three, four times a week for about three months as he talked me through um, Pat and Ryan, who also worked with me on the programming and making of these quick time films also incredibly important. So what you're going to see here is you've got to always talk about the fact that there's a context, there's a group of people, and you're seeing layering. You're seeing a kind of layers of um, of imagery that somehow it's hard to get the depth, the full depth of it when you watch it on a screen. But there was something very peculiar about this strange depth that could be achieved by working together with these people. I mean, what I liked about the grid is um, uh, the young students took it more or less upon themselves to dance through the performances. So again, it was almost like a, a, a digital analog coming together. You could imagine, say, if Kraftwerk had done a show <laughs> like that, it would have been choreographed down to the last German detail. But being Manchester, the grid system, which seemed so formal, was then occupied by 12 students with a, a range of dance styles and dance abilities. And I thought that gave a kind of endearing humanness to it and gave that digital analog an, a, 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 an extra layer of, of meaning. Um, I, I just want to come to, to Peter, but you mentioned earlier about how, how Liam worked much more closely with uh, Bernard and the rest of the band uh, on this than you traditionally have ever done. And I wondered, um, the, the sleeve artwork, uh, some, let's think about some of the classic um, artwork, say um, Power, Corruption and Lies, mm. which you know is one of their finest albums and one of your finest works. Obviously, the name of the band does not appear on the front cover. But if you could talk through how a record like that was, was uh, how a sleeve like that was created and, and what gave you the confidence that the name of the band didn't need to be on the sleeve. Um, well, I mean, actually, from the very beginning, um, so from, from, from Unknown Pleasures, in fact, um, I tried to I tried to make the things that I wanted to have. So in a way, you know, I, I was I was free to do what I wanted, but it, in that sense, I, I did what I wanted to have. The you know, factory factory existed outside of the 
the commercial remit of the music industry. And, and it existed as a kind of a, an autonomous collective um, within which everybody involved had the opportunity to do whatever it was that they wanted to do in the way that they felt like doing it. There was, there was no hierarchical structure. I mean, <clears throat> it, it would have not have come together at all without Tony. Tony definitely is the kind of the central body around which and around whom all the other players existed in, in orbits. But there were no instructions from anyone. There were no collective instructions. There were no um, individual instructions. So um, everybody was, everybody had the liberty to, to play their part as they individually saw fit. And I mean, to some extent for me, you know, the whole the whole thing was a kind of a, a vanity exercise in 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 hipness. Um, I I was trying to define myself at the beginning in 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 the same way that you know everybody was trying to define themselves. Um, I did have I did have the feeling that I that that I had a feeling that pop culture needed remodeling at that time. Um, I was not, I was not experiencing within the context of pop culture, the things that I was becoming interested in and factory provided me the opportunity to, to bring those things that I was interested in, into the context of pop and the, you know, the, the nature of joy division at the beginning. And then in a way, the kind of the, the sort of volatile chemistry that was their new order for, for 10 or 15 years um, created me, created the freedom for me to do that. I mean, you know, throughout the 80s, um, New Order did not instruct me in what they wanted. They, um, it, it was understood that, that, that they made the records and I made the sleeves. So the sleeves were an opportunity for me to to make things that I wanted to have. Now, um, being a being a consumer of pop records, you know, from the age of fifteen in let's say nineteen seventy, um, I, I never found the need to see a name or a title written on a record in order to find it in a record shop. I never I never failed to find. A record that I wanted. I mean, perhaps it might not be in the shop, but you never failed to find it. I mean, no one ever needed to have the name on the front to to realize that they had what they wanted in their hands. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, and and without any any commercial remit upon me from other people, I, I, there was no need to put the name on the front. And I have to say, when I did Unknown Pleasures, I thought it looked, I thought it looked a bit vulgar putting the name on the front. I mean, it looked a bit obvious. Um, it wasn't very cool, you know, to put Joy Division on the front. And I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out how to put Unknown Pleasures with that diagram. So I didn't do it. And, and nobody told me otherwise. And, um, and I don't think it's ever affected people finding the records. It affected me knowing what the tracks were called. But, um, <laughs> but, but for, I mean, you know, I, I made the covers I wanted. The, so the covers I wanted out of home. How did you feel when the Americans splurged the title on? Well, by the on I, yeah, by the time that happened, I had, by the time that happened, obviously I had began to work in the music business and 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 and, and had become used to to the, the 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 protocol, which was that if the name of the group and the name of the album or record was not on the front cover in the top third then a record store would not stock it. So I accepted when Power Corruption Lies um, had a title put on the front. The, the funny thing about that was that it was put on in a very utilitarian kind of pragmatic way in a upper and lowercase sans serif font, which kind of horrified me at the time. But since round about 1995, has looked remarkably cool. So I kind of quite like it now. Uh, there, there was one uh, song that was played this evening, um, Subculture, and uh, the, which was came out in 1985, 
and um, and and the story or the rumor is that I mean it didn't come with um, a sleeve design. It came in a, a black bag, uh, a black card, and uh, there was some typography on the inner sleeve. Um, and and I wondered um, the rumor is that you didn't you weren't inspired enough by the record, which I find incredibly hard to believe. No, no, that 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 that, that, that rumor that that's a. Um, that's a degree of autonomy or freedom that I did not have. Uh, okay. I, I was not free to choose. I mean, I could have said someone else could do it, but I was yeah. never. I never had. I never had the the the, the authority to say there shouldn't be a sleeve. Um, no, I, all I can presume is that one was not asked for. Okay. I think maybe I think maybe Rob Breton wanted a kind of disco bag in the kind of South Soul yes. or. New and York maybe, style. Maybe he wanted it out by the end of the month and he knew that if he asked me, that was not going to happen. <laughs> uh, does it bug you that um, throughout your career, your reputation is for delivering stuff late? Mm. No. <laughs> I mean, I know why it was late, but I also know that I'm sitting here talking about it now 40 years later. So, I mean, you know. You can deal say? with that. In well, terms of that, I cared sorry. about the work. I cared about the work more than about the releases. I cared about my part of it. With 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 music, I mean, you know, so much of the liberty is afforded to the musicians, and they, you know, they try to operate within their own schedule. And then, of course, there is this burden then placed upon other people to to do their part, sometimes in in no time at all, and and. And from my own point of view, it mattered. My work mattered the most to me, and it mm. mattered to me that I did I did my part the way I the way I thought it should be done, and, yeah. and therefore I had to kind of um, I had to be in denial actually of 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 the speed of the system. I understood it. I just didn't want to be part of it, and also I was concerned. As to as to what the work meant to me and my life, and not just a matter of keeping some record companies happy. Was there, was there a, a, any time? I mean, I know, obviously knowing New Order and Rob Gretton, uh, the late great Rob, um, when when the artwork was presented, I can imagine most times there was a kind of yeah, that 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 that's all right, you know, kind of feedback. No, it it, it but, never got presented. It didn't get okay. presented, Dave. It would more often than not go from me to the printer. So that is they, would it, they would not see it until it was finished. And I have to say that they never said they liked it. It was uh, one day in 93 before they actually said that they liked something. The, the cover of Regret. Uh, and actually Bernard turned to me and he said, I think you're beginning to get the hang of it. So... Um, uh, they would more often than not see the covers when they were in the shops. Yeah. And um, that's how it was. Uh, I've got a question from um, Chuck McSorley. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Somewhere via social media. Who came up with the equation uh, for the name of the New Order Liam Gillett show that we've just seen? And could you explain the equation? Yeah, well... I've been working with equations for a while in my artwork. I did a big one on the side of the museum in Istanbul in 2015. And I kind of like the universal language of maths. You don't need to, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from. If you can read mathematics, you're okay. You can speak across any language, basically. And also, you know, they a lot of equations carry um, quite a deep philosophical meaning, but expressed in quite a simple form. So for this one, I wanted to try to have something where you couldn't say it easily, right? Where it wasn't just something you could sort of name it. I didn't want to get involved in the procedures that the band might normally be involved in with song titles and, and, and this confusion about it. So to give it something that couldn't be said, but could be seen would emphasize the visual part of it. Um, now, actually coming up with a good equation wasn't that easy, to be honest. Um, this one is just the sum of new order, 12 keyboard players, 
Manchester International Festival and me. But the final elegant solution was actually Bernard's son, who actually has got a decent education, <laughs> and was capable of putting it into mathematically logical form. So uh, he should be thanked for that, actually. And coming back to what Peter was saying, actually, a little bit about this thing of of not saying much or not complimenting, I found it was the closest I've come to working on a serious art exhibition or art project where, frankly, people don't just go around all the time lovying each other and going on about how brilliant they are. It's work. So we kind of basically would work. And then there'd be times when we weren't working. We might have a drink or two, talk about something completely different like politics or or science or football or something like that. But, you know, the idea of everyone doing their own job, um, <clears throat> I, of course, do do things on time always, um, was very clear, like everyone was doing their thing. And um, you do your yeah, own there work. Were moments, there were really you good do emotional do moments. Do but work on time. <laughs> That's true. It's what you were saying. Sorry, you're correct. Sorry, Peter. Well, I was just it, took James, you it took time. James Joyce. Um, took James Joyce seven years to write Ulysses, and I can't imagine anyone was stood behind him saying, "Hurry up, James." Um, so that's how long work takes. Um, on in in terms of the the moving, because one of the things about Manchester International Festival is it commissions new work, pioneering work, and and the and the idea of the artists being very involved. And as we've heard, you know. Um, uh, the band were extremely involved in this project. Um, but the other thing about the Inter International Festival is that work then often goes out of Manchester um, to the big wide world. Now, this show was quite an expensive uh, thing to put on. The structure was not a cheap and easy structure. It wasn't like a rock and roll show. Um, and so that limited the number of places that we could go on to. And as I said, we went on to uh, Vienna and we went on to uh, OGR in, in Turin, Torino. So, um, and there we had a particular problem with the, the grid and because it wouldn't go six on top of six. So what happened, what did we do? In, tell us about what happened when you went to Turin and and uh and vienna liam how did the show have to adapt to those well i've been uh, i've been thinking about ogr in turin a lot recently because it's become that venue where we were uh playing those concerts having such a great night and the italian fans are so extraordinary and so full of uh focus and energy and goodwill um that place has become a temporary hospital right now wow. that actual venue and the thing is, it's an old industrial building where they used to fix and build trains, <clears throat> which is actually quite a good venue for a concert like this. And, um, you know, I, we, I basically always thought that it would be possible to adapt this set. And we did basically, we kind of stripped it down to one layer and slotted it in to the, to the venue. And... I think it worked really well in the end. I mean, it created a different, uh, uh, it created a lot more width than normally a stage has, right? A normal rock stage is quite narrow, in fact. So that width actually worked very well in that venue, I think. But um, my thoughts right now are more for the fact that that place, which has had some amazing concerts, like Kraftwerk concerts, amazing um, uh DJ nights. And in fact, Dave, that when we were there, you did your cocktail DJing, which I thought was very uh, effective one afternoon. My, co in huh? my cocktail drink. My cock oh, yeah, my cocktail. Yeah, yeah, yeah my you did cocktail, your cocktail DJing. Cocktail DJing uh, just in case <laughs> you know, the way you do that is you fill the audience full of very strong cocktails and then you play any old shit and everyone dances. That is how. <laughs> The secret of cocktail DJing. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but it was, um, you know, the idea was always to adapt everything, right? And to make it work. The problem then that you do have is the relationship between the musicians and the band and the conductor. And you've got to imagine that Joe, who arranged everything and conducted 
live at every concert is being viewed by the the the, the young musicians inside their little cells on a monitor. So he's being filmed on the stage to the side of the stage, um, you know, conducting everything. He's very closely in contact with Steve, who's drumming, Stephen, who, of course, is the root of most of the songs and has, none, you know, he's kind of guiding when we should really start. And they're watching him. So when you spread the set out really wide, you've got quite a long distance between the furthest musicians and their sense of connection to the to the band but it seemed to work in the end in fact i would argue that the design of these cells helped um young very focused very highly trained musicians also have a sense of protection being protected from from the crowd being protected and being able to really work get on with their work without feeling too exposed in a certain way and, and most of them seem to have a good time i mean they they were amazing incredible incredible it's there's a certain amount of shelter. There's a certain amount of shelter for them, I think, in there. Mm. Yeah. Did you uh, want to jump in on something earlier as well, Peter? Yeah, I just wanted to say about the, the Liam's equation title. I mean, um, <clears throat> it's very good the way that was done in that it, it did evoke kind of chemistry and the notion of an experiment. And and the whole the project was an experiment. And and the outcome, you know, to some extent, the outcomes were unknown or unexpected. And I think that. That, that, that presenting the project with that kind of equation sort of title did give this idea that this is a, um, a new and unknown uh, combination of elements here. And, and um, we're not even sure how it will work out. Come and, come and see what happens. And, and combined with you know, that phrase, so it goes, which is itself kind of rather ambiguous, I, I think it was kind of a very interesting way to title things. Yeah, and I, I mean, obviously that, that hadn't been done before in that way. And, you know, I remember in, in the process uh, how uh, there were, you know, weeks even when uh, everybody was having to keep the fingers crossed that we were, you know, we would be able to do what we wanted to do. And then also, uh, very sadly, in the run up to it was 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 also the Manchester bomb. And, you know, and, and that, uh, you know, as these things do, that kind of changed everything. So the fact that we were able to do MIF that year so well and New Order to play so well was one of those moments of kind of redemption in a way for, for Manchester. Yeah. And I, I should say at this point that probably, you know, for whatever it is for 35 years or so you know right back to sort of the beginning of new order i've always wondered what a new order gig should look like you know i've gone to them and they've had their moments in fact in the early days they had quite remarkable moments but always when i'm at a gig i think what should this really look like and and i think that the the, the collaboration with liam definitely created one of the ways that a new order gig should look mm -hmm. this it is it's kind of what you would expect if you went to see them and mm -hmm. uh, and, and i i think it um it was it 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 it, it does fulfill um an opportunity that's always been there to to happen you know for them to collaborate with somebody who could bring you know another dimension to what they do mm -hmm. Uh, I think one of, one of the other things that I enjoyed about the synthesizer orchestra was the fact that the students obviously were were uh, you know young young enough to be children of the band. I'm not saying any of them were, but they were young enough to be. Um, and uh, and and I, and I think that the one of the key things that Manchester needs to always remember is that although the city has a great history and legacy and a past, it is very much about passing on the baton to the next generations, giving people, as always, I think, in any kind of art, when you get to a certain point of in your life and in maybe in your profile and your recognition, you kind of switch to then thinking about your own personal legacy or the legacy of a scene, and you want to give ammunition to the next generation so that they have everything they would ever need and ever need to seize uh, to make their own culture just as, as we did. And I think having 
just having that youthful uh, that youthful sense gave us, I think, gave us something very very special in in that because also the you know uh, Liam talks about you know uh, after the shows all meeting up etc. And it wasn't you know uh, a VIP area with you know Liam and Bernard. Uh, or what, Liam and the band, it was very much a kind of family atmosphere. And, I, and, I, and that's actually one of the things that looking back on that three years later is something that I remember was the kind of the camaraderie between the generations. Yeah, I was, I was lucky enough. Yeah, I was lucky enough to watch and be at some of the rehearsals, the music rehearsals, and also watching the way that Bernard worked with everyone and the way that they um it was real it was real you know it wasn't like this sort of fakey bullshitty master class kind of nonsense it was actual people struggling to do something it's actually quite difficult to do what they do it's very deceptive when you see these concerts and it's very it's very it's not easy a lot of the way that the the songs are structured is not the way you would do it if you were kind of a fully trained Musician, so to deconstruct them and then try and replay them. Also, as Stevens pointed out a number of times, the programming and the sequencing in some of the tracks was never intended to be played that fast. Yeah. Certainly I not think live. That was, the, 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 exactly. respect on, the respect on all sides was actually, even from day one, first rehearsal, I remember Bernard being amazed at how these music students could sight read. So they had the sheet music, <laughs> and Bernard was like, how can they do that? How, how can they play Vanishing Point? They didn't even know Vanishing Point, and, you know, <laughs> they were able to go straight into it. We do have to finish in a moment. I would like to ask Peter the last question, which refers back to what I was saying about uh, Manchester and, and our, our history as a city, as a, as a, as a music city and a, and a creative capital. Um, how, how do you see us in the future, uh, using but not always falling back on the yellow and black stripes and, and with the, the, the we do things differently slogan, uh, it's important for the city to keep moving on. And, and how, how do we do that? How do we manage to use the past in order to help us? Dave, really, I mean, young people, youth culture is, youth culture is um, the product of young people. And really um, nobody needs to um, give them permission to do it and no one needs to tell them to do it and certainly nobody gave us permission um, to, to, to do what we wanted to do for ourselves that said I mean I find it remarkably tolerant of the younger generations in Manchester that they have any time at all for something that, that, that started 40 years ago I mean it's the equivalent for my generation of Glenn Miller. I mean, it's sort of, um, we're, we're, we've got, we're several generations adrift here. Um, yeah. That young people are even remotely interested or can take some kind of, you know, conceptual inspiration from it and then go and do what the fuck they wanna do. That's really, you know, what sh should be happening. And, uh, and to a great extent, some of us, we shouldn't even get it. We know we yeah. shouldn't even know what it is. And yeah. I mean, I probably don't. And, and I don't pretend that I do. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been a, a great evening. I think MIF are going to put some kind of uh, a visual on to, to mark the end of this session. But uh, thank you to MIF for and putting up to them. And, and thank you for uh, your input. And thank you to everybody uh, who's been viewing throughout the evening. And, uh, uh, and goodbye from all of us. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Miss you.